Okay. Um, so for this next ritual, we're going to go uh, old school. Is Sarah here, our volunteer coordinator? Yeah, you're here? Okay. So Sarah, um, who can you check who signed up to um, sacrifice themselves so that we can all be atoned for our sins? <laughs> Does that one? No? No one signed up? We, we forgot to put it on the Google Sheet? Okay, well, okay, uh, okay, it's okay, we have a plan B, right? Did, um, who remembered to bring the goats? <laughs> no, because what we're gonna do is one of the goats, we'll, um, we will, um, the lucky goat, we will slaughter and eat at the potluck tomorrow, and um, tonight, oh my God, tonight, and um, the, um, and the other goat, we're gonna put our sins uh, on, onto them and send them off onto Woodward, I'm thinking. <laughs> so, okay, so, so someone getting the goats? No one signed up? I really thought we had a more volunteer spirit <laughs> in this congregation. Um, okay, I, so what you're telling me is that we're supposed to just magically be cleansed of our sins without human or animal sacrifice? Inconceivable! All right, who, who else read the lottery when you were a kid? Yeah, okay, like really messed up, right? Okay, who can, can someone remind us of the story? It's a little audience participation here. Who can, yeah, uh, uh, Rachel, give us a brief, the, the quickie. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, in case not everybody heard. So the village gathers. The village gathers for the annual uh, ritual, which is intended to ensure a good harvest and uh, purge the town of bad omens. A household picks the fated lot. And within that household, lots are drawn again. When at last, the townspeople stone the victim uh, the martyr, I guess, uh, to, d to death. Um, can folks see me back there? Is it better if I stand up on the step? You can see me okay? Is that right? Great. <sighs> Not this year. <laughs> Oy. When this short story uh, was published in the New Yorker in 1948, it inspired a massive amount of hate mail. The author, Shirley Jackson, uh, she wrote, even my mother scolded me, saying, Dad and I did not care at all for your story. It does seem, dear, that this gloomy kind of story is what all you young people think about these days. Why don't you write something to cheer people up? I don't know why I assume that's what she sounded like, but. The practice of lottery appears twice on Yom Kippur. As I mentioned, the fates of the two goats are determined by lots. And the other is in the book of Jonah, which is read uh, traditionally this afternoon. Let's get a quick Jonah recap. Who can give us a Jonah recap? What happens in the book of Jonah? Barbara. Great, beautiful. In case uh, you didn't hear, Barbara, um, we, we meet this reluctant prophet when God's instructing him to go to Nineveh to tell the people to repent. He refuses. He doesn't think that these sinners should get a second chance. And um, 
So he jumps on this boat uh, to Tarshish, and while a very dangerous storm rages, do you remember what, what he's doing? He's sleeping below. And uh, the captain is like, WTF, Malacha near Dam, Kum Kra El Elohecha, how can you sleep in a time like this? Get up and call out to your God. The sailors draw lots to determine the cause of the storm, and Jonah is thrown overboard and swallowed by a whale who conveniently drops him off in Nineveh, the place that he was running away from. So there are two Yom Kippur lotteries. But when we think of the lottery, we don't think about Yom Kippur, right? What do we think of? Purim. Purim. It means lottery. Purim means lots. Mordecai won't bow to him, so Haman casts lots to determine which day he will kill all the Jews. So the theme of the lottery appears in both Yom Kippur and Purim, and they kind of sound similar, don't they, Yom Kippur and Purim? Coincidence? The rabbis think not. From the Talmud to the Zohar, the rabbis claim a deep connection between these two holidays. So let's talk about Purim just a little bit. Central theme of Purim is reversals of fortune, right? Esther chapter 9-1, when the king's command and decree were to be executed, the very day on which the enemies of the Jews had expected to get them in their power, vina hafochu, the opposite happened. Hafuch is opposite. Vina hafochu, everything is turned upside down. The rabbis encourage drinking as a way to access this state. Boundaries become blurred until up is down, left is right, ad lo yada, until we can't tell the difference between blessed be Mordechai and cursed be Haman. The Purim story doesn't end with Jewish rejoicing at Haman's execution. If only it did. Chapter 9, 1 again. When the king's command and decree were to be executed, the very day on which the enemies of the Jews had expected to get them in their power, the opposite happened. The Jews got their enemies in their power. No one could withstand them, for the fear of the Jews had fallen upon all the peoples. So the Jews struck at their enemies with the sword, slaying and destroying. They wreaked their will upon their enemies. According to the Megillah, to Megillah to stare, 75,000 Persians were killed at the hands of the Jews. The shocking and unbearable truth of Purim is that we can go from victim to villain just like that. Ad lo yada. We confuse ourselves to the point of being unable to tell the difference between good Mordechai and evil Haman because there is no actual difference between them. I mean, not essentially. When the tables are turned, we have the same capacity for cruelty as anyone else. For many years, I wrote off the last chapter of Esther as a revenge fantasy. And a revenge fantasy may have been fine, but in the words of journalist Peter Beinhardt, Jews didn't have armies and militaries when we wrote Esther, I should say. We wrote it. It didn't happen, as far as we know. When we wrote it, we didn't have armies and militaries. Even if you read the Purim story as plain texts of vengeance and extermination, they weren't that dangerous. But once you have a Jewish state, not just a Jewish state, but a Jewish supremacist state, a state that gives Jews legal supremacy over Palestinians, a state that's born with a mass expulsion of Palestinians, 
these texts become far, far more dangerous. Beinart's words were shared in a piece he called Purim after Hawara. Hawara is a Palestinian village in the occupied West Bank, just south of Nablus, the burial place of Joseph, and just north of Shiloh, the sacred site where Hannah goes to pray. A road that the state of Israel built to serve the settlement runs through the town, which is surrounded on all sides by settlements, which are illegal according to international law, of course. Many times the road has served as a, as a flashpoint, and it did again this year, a week before this past Purim. Hundreds of settlers went on a violent, late-night rampage to avenge the deaths of two of their brothers by Palestinian militants. When the settlers attacked, the Israeli army was there, either accompanying them, protecting them, or standing by as one Palestinian resident of the town, a civilian, was shot dead. More than 120 people were injured, and settlers set dozens of homes, buildings, and cars on fire. A witness said, I see in front of me flames. Wherever I turn my eyes, I see the flames of a burning house. The army commander for the area, Major General Yehuda Fuchs, described the incident as a pogrom. A pogrom? Jews don't do pogroms. Pogroms are done to us. The word was invented for us to describe the violence my grandfather fled from. Venafochu. The perpetrators paused their rampage to pray Ma'ariv, the evening service. Let's check in. Everyone okay? My heart's beating kind of fast. <laughs> we're gonna remind ourselves that we're all safe, that we're probably next to people who really care about us. I'll remind myself. So let's take a breath. <sighs> this hard stuff but that's why we're here, right? The practice of listening resiliently to the voices of Palestinians, Israelis, and each other is the foundation upon which tshuva is made possible. So thank you. Thank you for offering your listening hearts. I'm gonna tell you now about something your fellow community members and I experienced a few months ago. As part of a delegation with another Reconstructionist, Shul, this summer members of Tahiya visited the West Bank city of Hebron. Our guides, former soldiers from Breaking the Silence, began our tour at the grave of Baruch Goldstein, Yimach Shmo. It was on Purim in 1993 when Goldstein, a doctor from Brooklyn, living in a settlement near Hebron, entered into the mosque in the tomb of the patriarchs and opened fire. This observant Jew murdered 29 Muslims at prayer, injuring dozens more. He committed mass murder inspired by the story of Purim. Goldstein was a follower of Mayor Kahana, who at the time was considered very fringe. Now, in the current Israeli government, followers of Kahana hold office in the highest levels of government. 
a party that was once banned from parliament for being too racist, is now in power in a new incarnation. Israel's current public security minister, Itamar Ben-Gvir, was said to have had a picture of Baruch Goldstein in his house. Nafohu. Goldstein's tombstone describes him as a martyr. It reads, he gave his life for the Jewish people, its Torah and its land. He was blameless and upright. Stones cover the headstone. A sign that the site is frequently visited with tenderness and respect. Tachia's partner synagogue on this trip was Dor Hadash, represented by Wendy, Rich, Sam, and Rabbi Amy. Dor Hadash is the Reconstructionist community that meets inside the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. Tragically, we've all heard of the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. Because on a morning, on a Shabbat morning in 2018, a white supremacist murdered 11 Jews gathered for study and prayer. The very same week we were standing in Hebron, the trial in Pittsburgh was in full swing. Wendy, one of our fellow travelers, had testified in court just days before. I will never forget the look on Rich's face as he stared at Goldstein's grave in disbelief. How could Jews, ourselves the target of so much violence and hate, ourselves perpetrate such horrors? How could we venerate such horrors? Shirley Jackson's biographer wrote that the lottery anticipates the way we would come to understand the 20th century's unique lessons about the capacity of ordinary citizens to do evil. In 1948, with the fresh horrors of the Second World War barely receding into memory and the Red Scare just beginning, it's no wonder that the story's first readers reacted so vehemently to this ugly glimpse of their own faces in the mirror, even if they did not realize exactly what they were looking at. If it's frightening to imagine that regular people can do evil, how much more so to see victims act as villains? We understand intellectually that the abused often become the abuser, that hurt people hurt people. And yet, it's so difficult to accept. At a demonstration in Nabi Saleh some years ago, the dissonance I felt was overwhelming. After studying in yeshiva in Jerusalem, I spent time bearing witness in the West Bank, uh, not far from Hawara. The tear gas used against unarmed protesters was worse than I could have imagined. I felt like my face was on fire, truly. Delirious with pain, I, I, I had this thought that was just Again and again in my mind, the only thing I could think was those soldiers are nice Jewish boys. How, how could they do this to me? How could Jews do this? And there we reveal one of my fundamental flaws. 
there is some part of me, even now, that believes that Jews are better. I am a Jewish supremacist. Beinart again, he says, what we need is not just a revolution in Israel-Palestine, not a revolution against Benjamin Netanyahu to save democracy for Jews, but a, a revolution for legal equality rather than Jewish supremacy. A revolution about the notion of the Jewish potential for evil. There is something fundamentally broken, something fundamentally wrong in the way that many, many Jewish institutions and Jews around the world Think about Judaism that erases our capacity for evil and prevents us from fighting it. For years, it was, I, it was my job. I, I felt that it was my job, no matter what Israel did, to identify an excuse, to find a justification. The IDF always had their reasons. We may not understand them, but they always made the moral choice. But it turns out that we are not superhuman, that Jews are people too. That day in Nabi Saleh, I experienced both tremendous physical pain and spiritual agony. The myth of the essential righteousness of my people up in tear gas smoke before my eyes. But when the smoke cleared, I was free. Released from the impossible burden of upholding Jewish supremacy. It, it should go without saying that unlearning Jewish supremacy does not mean learning Jewish inferiority. Right? It should go without saying, because it's quite the opposite. The idea that Jews are better than other people and the idea that they're worse are two sides of the same coin. They are both manifestations of anti-Semitism. We're not self-hating Jews, though we do sometimes experience internalized anti-Semitism. That's a subject for a whole other drosh, but for now I'm, I, I need to name two things that are critical for us to understand as we move forward together. While both Israeli and American Jews shoulder significant responsibility, this is not all our fault. The toxic blend of militarized capitalism, genocidal anti-Semitism, racism, religious nationalism, colonialism, and trauma got us into this mess, not some flaw in our character. That's the first thing. The second is that we are worthy of protection. Jews are worthy of protection. No more and no less than anyone else. We will not allow either of these precious peoples to be sacrificed. On Purim, we don't just recite, right? We, we reenact. We, we embody. This reenactment guides us to the point where we can't tell the difference between us and them, allowing us to ask a whole new set of questions. If we were the residents of Hawara and our occupiers who steal our land, whose army is against us, who has a whole army to protect them, etc. If we were those people in Hawara, what would we ask of a community connected to our oppressors by heritage, faith, affiliation, maybe even blood? It would probably 
sounds something like the captain of Jonah's ship, get up, kum, kra, get up and cry out to your God. I tried to write so many other dress shirt. This is not, not the teaching I wanted to give for so many reasons. First of all, because it's dark as hell. I feel like Shirley Jackson, right, sharing bleak and brutal stories when we are so badly in need of tenderness and comfort. And second, because this teaching carries so many risks. What if I alienate my colleagues? What if I embolden anti-Semites? What if my words cause one of you to feel like I don't love you or that you don't belong? Chas v'shalom, heaven forbid. I take these risks because we have no choice. We simply cannot call ourselves social justice Jews without looking in the mirror. We take these risks because fascism there has a direct impact on our ability to do justice here. Because we have seen our own beloved local leaders attacked for refusing to tow the party line. We take these risks because an injustice is happening with our tax and philanthropic dollars and in our name. We can try to run away like Jonah, believe me, I've, I've tried. But the lots will always fall on us. There is work we must do and particular roles that each of us individually and as a community must play. We're fighting on two fronts. To work for, Palestinian, for justice for Palestinians urgently and to rescue Jewishness from the fascists. The storm will not stop raging until we've done what is ours to do. What's our work this year? That's a good question. The answer to which is on a paper that doesn't seem to be here. Here it is. <laughs> Needed that. What's our work this year? Sarah, Mercy, Jen, Greg, and I will continue to share about our trip. Jacob Sable is going to support the Olive Harvest with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. I just joined a Palestinian Voices study group for Jewish leaders and plan to facilitate a Nakba curriculum. Maybe you will join, if not now's, fight against APAC, donate to B'Tselem, volunteer with Rashida, lobby Congress with J Street, get involved in JVP's No Tech for Apartheid campaign. Will we have hard conversations with family and friends? The extremity of the current government provides an opening, an opportunity for more of our fellow Jews to ask the questions that lead to unlearning, that lead to learning, that lead to action. And a critical piece of resisting fascism is building the alternative. Every time we grow a democratic Jewish community, we are undermining the occupation. Every time we practice a queer and feminist Judaism, we are fighting fascism. Every time we act in solidarity with our Arab neighbors, we are challenging apartheid. We don't have the temple, and we don't have the goats, and we refuse to sacrifice each other. But maybe, just maybe, 
if we each find our role, if we stretch ourselves one inch further, if we have the courage to see ourselves and our people in all our pain and humanity, then teshuva is possible. Nahafochu, if victim can become villain, then anything is possible, which means that a liberated world is also possible. Let's hold each other close as we reach for the hope of this season, for the possibility of teshuva, for the possibility of transformation. Gmar Khatima Tova. May we all be inscribed, may we all inscribe each other in the book of life. Amen.